very excited to finally have a chance to talk about uh, Anti Smash. I think it's a it's a very useful tool uh, that's that I think is quite easy to use, especially if you go with the the web server. Uh, there's also a standalone version that you can access through the command line, which I think is uh, fairly easy to use. Uh, but that's because I installed it using Conda. Actually, uh, to be honest, haven't tried installing the um, haven't tried installing it another way. So if you have Conda, uh, I can say that it's really easy to install and use. Uh, and another thing that I like about Anti Smash is that it provides a, a very nice output that's amenable to both visual inspection and downstream analyses or any uh, computational parsing that you want to do with the data. Okay. So first, I want to give a, a bit of a background on what secondary metabolites are. So these tend to be uh, organic molecules produced by microorganisms like bacteria and archaea. Uh, they're also produced by fungi and, and plants. Uh, and they're, they're called secondary metabolites because uh, they're not part of central or primary metabolism. So, so they're considered non-essential for normal growth uh, and development of an organism. So what it essentially means is that if these genetic, the genetic capacity for these, for the production of these uh, secondary metabolites is disrupted or knocked out in an organism, the organism can still function. Uh, but it does mean that the deletion, does not mean that the deletion won't have a deleterious effect on an organism. So for example, removal of a siderophore uh, synthesis uh, gene cluster can impede an organism's ability to obtain iron from the environment. And I'll talk about siderophores a little bit more later on. Uh, so one important class of secondary metabolites are antimicrobials. And, and these are compounds that are secreted by microbes that target, uh, target other organisms. And I've, I've pasted a couple of examples here from this uh, nice uh, review uh, showing uh, penicillin, which is, a, I think it was one the, the first discovered antibiotic from uh, penicillin chrysogenin, and it actually targets uh, the bacterial cell wall, and it prevents synthesis of the bacterial cell wall. Uh, there's also bleomycin. Uh, this looks like a, a lot larger molecule, and this actually induces breaks in DNA strands. It's produced by streptomyces, and it's uh, co-opted by, by humans as an anti-tumor agent. And there's also a class of antibiotics called Averm avermectins, um, and these block transmission of electrical activity in the vertebrae nerve and muscle cells. So like I said, these uh, compounds have been co-opted by people for use in various medically relevant contexts, and the mining of genomic data sets uh, is a very uh, useful, <clears throat> potentially fruitful venture because we can discover a lot more secondary metabolites that could be of use in the, in the medical context. So some bacteria are essentially gold mines when it comes to antimicrobials. One example of this is Streptomyces, uh, which I mentioned in the previous slide. And it produces many antimicrobial compounds that we know of and perhaps many more that have yet to be discovered. And the compounds are also broken down by class or type here. Uh, there, there's different types of bacteriocin, lantibiotics, uh, cyclic amino acids. So we can identify secondary metabolites based on their biosynthesis pathways, which are often encoded uh, on the genomes as genetic islands or, or operons or clusters of operons that code for enzymatic machinery that synthesize each metabolite. And these clusters of genes that are responsible for the synthesis of secondary metabolites are uh, called BGCs, or biosynthetic gene clusters. Uh, for one example shown here, the biosynthesis of uh, actinorodin, it's encoded by about 20 genes that are encoded all in close proximity to each other, but it looks like they're broken up in multiple operons. <clears throat> Another example to demonstrate the complexity of the biosynthesis of these metabolites is the prod prodigenine biosynthesis pathway, 
which also takes about 20 or so genes that are encoded uh, in close proximity to each other. Uh, another important type of secondary metabolites that I mentioned uh, a few slides back is the siderophore. So these are also secreted by bacteria, uh, like antimicrobials, but instead of targeting other organisms, these target iron. So these compounds, siderophores, actually chelate iron, and then the iron siderophore compound is taken up by the cell and used for whatever the cell uses iron for. Uh, for example, it could either store it or it could use it as a cofactor in an enzyme, a heme, or an iron sulfur cluster. Uh, and, and organisms tend to encode specific transporters for the siderophores that they can produce. Uh, so they'll produce a siderophore inside the cell, secrete it, the siderophore will bind the iron, and then the, that siderophore iron compound will be taken up by the cell. But there's also cheaters out there. Cheaters are mic microbes that can uptake siderophores that they themselves did not synthesize. So they're essentially stealing the siderophores from other organisms to, uh, as a strategy to uh, scavenge iron in the environment. Uh, in this slide, I show that there's multiple ways of siderophores to be synthesized. Uh, there's the NRPS siderophore production pathway, and then the NRPS independent siderophore production, or the NIS production pathway. So NRPS stands for non-ribosomal peptide synthase, and these are mega enzymes that consist of modular domains uh, that are each responsible for a, a various um, aspect of actually synthesizing the siderophore. For example, you could have a ventilation domain, you could have a dilation, condensation to combine them together. So these domains uh, incorporate and sequentially link amino acids, keto acids, and fatty acids, and hydroxy acids. Uh, and, and I think this is somewhat analogous to what a ribosome does. Uh, it's basically sequentially adding uh, amino acids, which is why it has the name that it does. It's just a peptide synth synthase, uh, but it's, it's not a ribosome, hence the non-ribosomal part of the name. Uh, the NIS pathway consists of multiple enzymes that each have a single role in the production of a siderophore. Uh, one of the siderophores that's produced um, here is a cyclic L lipopeptide. Uh, aerobactin is one of the siderophores produced via the NRPS. Uh, so now moving on to uh, anti-smash. Uh, and so anti-smash uh, was released almost 10 years ago now with uh, this workflow as figure one. And um, it has more or less retained this workflow, although there's been additional features added. So uh, just to briefly go over the workflow, you can provide the program with a genome sequence, and this can be in uh, various formats, which is really convenient. So you could provide a gene bank file, or you could provide a FASTA file, and then it runs a gene prediction algorithm. Uh, here shown is Glimmer 3, which is used for uh, fungal sequences, but now it incorporates prodigal as well if you want to give it bacterial sequences. And this, this is optional because if you provide it with a gene bank file, it just takes the uh, the gene sequences from that file rather than uh, predicting genes. Uh, then it uses uh, profile hidden Markov models, HMMs, uh, and Hummer to profile the provided data set and identify gene clusters. And then that output is fed through various um, modules of the program for various uh, things. For example, the uh, domain analysis, which also uses uh, hidden Markov uh, HMM library. It uses regex or regular expressions, HMMs for predicting chemical structures. It has a blast feature that allows it to uh, blast the identified gene clusters against a database of known gene clusters. Uh, and then that essentially leads to the output file that you get at the end, uh, which uh, I'll go over later on. So over the decade or so that anti-smash has been available, there's been numerous improvements and the new version of anti-smash has actually been released every two years. Uh, uh, 
sort of the slide I just showed the differences between version one and two, which they nicely uh, talk about in the publication. As you can see that uh, version two retains a lot of what anti-smash 1.0 can do, but also adds a couple of new features like uh, structural modeling and uh, protein sequence input. With version two, three, we saw the release of something called MyBig, which contains a curated repository of biosynthetic gene clusters uh, from genomes available in RefSeq. Uh, this version also enabled a plugin for Genius. Uh, so that allows for offline editing and uh, curation of identified biosynthetic gene clusters, which is also nice. I don't personally use Genius, but um, so I can't really speak to how well this works, but it's a nice option to have. So anti-SMASH4 had more improvements uh, and the main text publication had a nice table that breaks down the improved pipeline. So the, the rule-based detection of biosynthetic gene clusters are essentially based on results from Hummer, which is used to query the profile HMMs, which make up the uh, anti-SMASH library. And the HMMs are for various uh, domains and genes that are thought to be part of biosynthetic gene clusters. So these results are then parsed back and analyzed to check for uh, expected combinations of domains and genes. And uh, th that, that's used to predict the presence of secondary metabolite. And in some cases even predict the, the type of metabolite that's produced. And there, there's also cluster specific analyses that you can run. And, and I'll, I'll go over the options for these with the uh, with the standalone version of, of anti-smash. Uh, and this uses also various uh, rules and uh, regex, looking for various codons and, and uh, active sites. And then genome comparisons, which basically is a BLAST-based uh, alignment analysis that compares your identified uh, clusters or genes against what's known, what's out there that's known. Slide. So anti-smash version 5 is the latest version of the software. This version features improvements in the web interface of anti-smash. Uh, and this web interface, which I'll go over in a second, uh, I really like it. It offers a very intuitive way, I think, to examine the results. So the web interface of anti-smash uh, looks like this. So if you, if you actually just Google anti-smash, uh, you'll get, uh, and you click on the first result, uh, you'll get a page that looks like this. As you can see, you can submit both bacterial sequences with this tab, or you can also submit fungal sequences and plant sequences as well. If you click on the download, which I'll go over in a second as well, that will allow you to access the installation instructions and the, uh, the brief tutorial for the standalone version. And that'll allow you to download the standalone version as well. Uh, and you can actually download the entire package, which uh, would allow you to uh, look at the HMM library manually if you're so interested in doing so. So uh, if you just look at the first page, I think it's pretty straightforward. You can load sample input you know, or open example output. You can provide an email address. Uh, this is optional. So if you wanna submit sequences and then close the tab, uh, then the results will be emailed to you <clears throat> uh, when it's done. You can provide an NCBX session number uh, for a genome sequence that you want to analyze for biosynthetic gene clusters. Uh, or you could also uh, click the upload file tab and then that'll change this uh, window here and it'll allow you to click browse and upload uh, your own FASTA or GeneBig file. You can also uh, toggle this thing around this uh, bar, which would control how uh, how strict you want the algorithm to be in terms of defining uh, biosynthetic gene clusters. Do you want it to be super strict and only identify clusters that are really similar and contain all of the elements of a known biosynthetic gene cluster, or do you want to be more loose with regard to identifying biosynthetic gene clusters? So, uh, as you can probably imagine, uh, going to loose will allow you to identify more distantly related or potentially novel biosynthetic gene clusters, but it also has the potential to give you a lot of false positives. Uh, and then you can 
also have your extra features here uh, turned on or off. Um, Active Site Finder, Cluster Blast, all this stuff uh, will uh, significantly uh, increase the length of time that ANSYS Mesh will run for, but it'll give you uh, more output. So then once you upload the file or you uh, up provide an NCB accession number, you click submit. Uh, if you don't provide your email, it'll take you to a page that'll keep, um, uh, I think, I haven't actually done, done it that way where I haven't provided the email, but I think it reloads itself every uh, 10 seconds or 20 seconds, just like the bl NCBI blast does until it's done, uh, increasing the interval of time in between uh, reloading the page. Okay, so once the results come in, either you get an email or if you wait in the, uh, if you don't provide your email, you just like, wait for it to load, you'll get a uh, output that looks like this, <clears throat> where you can actually have your different regions here. Um, you can click on each region if you want to inspect each region individually, but overall the results will be presented like this, where you have uh, your region, which corresponds to a region in your provided data set. And then you have the type of uh, bus the region cluster that's been identified, and then the uh, coordinates on the contig. And then you can also click the download tab here and download all the results, which would, which would generate a zipped file, which will have all of the results, including the HTML, which you can then click on and get to a page that looks like this. And it'll also have uh, GenBank files for each of these clusters. Okay, so right, so if you click on any one of these, it'll take you to a page that looks like this. And here you can see that the, each gene of the biosynthetic gene cluster that's been identified, uh, you see that it runs from approximately zero, one to uh, 6,650 nucleotides, so it's 6.6 .6 kilo base pair long uh, cluster of genes. And you see that there are six genes here that show similarity to the type three polyketide synthase uh, pathway. And they're color coded based on uh, the predicted function. So you see blue here is transport related genes. You have the core biosynthetic genes here in dark red and uh, other genes, I think that's it. It's actually kind of hard for me to make out the colors here. Okay. Oh yeah, so then you can click on each gene individually and then you'll get some gene details here. Well, more specific uh, coordinates, the length of nucleotides, and then the, the rule that has caused anti-smash to label this uh, a type three polyketide synthase. Uh, okay. Right, so I already mentioned this. Uh, this is a useful tab here if you want to download the results. Click on download all results, or you can just download the log file if you want to look at the, the run parameters. Or you can just download the GeneBank summary files if, if your computer is low on uh, storage. And then once you download, so if you click download all results, you'll get a folder that looks like this. This is my uh, provided a metagenome to AnsySmash, which was uh, recently published. Should probably provide the the, um, the citation for this data set, even though I don't I don't really go over the data set. It's just sort of um, this is just sort of to show what the output looks like. You get a bunch of GenBank files. And you get an HTML file, index.html. If you double click on this, it'll take you to a page like this. Uh, images doesn't really have anything useful. You have your input. If you click input, you'll get your data set that you provided, whether it's GeneBank or FASTA format. Uh, okay, so if you click on the download tab, let me go back to the anti smash. Page. If you click on this download and then you can click on documentation, it'll take you to a page that looks like this. And I just went with the Bioconda version. Uh, and it's really easy to uh, install if you have Bioconda installed in your, in your system. 
you just copy and paste these commands. So essentially, you create a conda environment called anti smash, and then that installs anti smash. Then you activate the environment, and then you download the anti smash databases, basically the PPM and other databases that it uses. And then whenever you're done, you click on deactivate, and you have some uh, sample input here. So this is the simplest version of the command. And I'll go over that in the tutorial. Uh, that I'll go over in the tutorial. Okay, so 